Alrighty, welcome back. We're having a grand time uh, harmonizing scripture with scripture. And isn't that what we always need to do? If there's one fatal flaw of Bible interpreters uh, for all history around the world, that's the problem right there. We give credence to one scripture and say, here's what the Bible says, but we don't harmonize our understanding of that scripture with the rest of the Bible, and we come up with an unbalanced uh, understanding. So people err on both sides of the grace and the works uh, equations, as it were, and we want to be where the Bible is, balanced in the middle, a balanced understanding. So all these scriptures that clearly, irrefutably tell us that holiness and obedience and keeping the commandments has something to do with ultimate salvation, we just don't blow those off because we know that salvation is by grace through faith. We harmonize these scriptures. Otherwise, we're guilty of perverting God's message. And uh, it's very easy, really, to harmonize. The grace that God is showing us is not a license to sin. Uh, Jude warned about false teachers who have turned the grace of God into licentiousness, that is, a license to sin. That's a perversion of the grace of God. The grace that God offers is a temporary opportunity to turn from your sins, receive forgiveness, and then walk the narrow path that leads to eternal life. Praise God, okay? And so uh, let us not presume uh, that God is giving us a license to sin. Oh, no, 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 he is not. He's giving us an opportunity to walk in holiness and be ready to stand before him. And that's the message of the Olivet Discourse in a nutshell. All right. Now, we talked last time about uh, the standards. Every Christian has some kind of standard in holiness, uh, of holiness, equating it uh, to a necessity for salvation. And I've proven that already. Uh, and, and so... Now the question is, where is your standard? Is your standard a biblical standard or is it an unbiblical standard? Do you understand the biblical minimum fruitfulness that a genuine Christian will demonstrate uh, and one who is ready to meet Jesus, ready to stand before God, ready to die? You gotta be meeting these standards. And we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9, 10, and 11, where the Apostle Paul warned, he said, don't be deceived. People who do these things, and he listed 10 different very grievous sins in God's eyes, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. I heard uh, one preacher say that Paul didn't mean they wouldn't get into heaven when he said they won't inherit the kingdom of God. He said, you just won't get so blessed on this earth. That's what Paul meant. Well, that's, that's a horrible perversion, uh, that inheriting the kingdom of God is a right from the lips of Jesus. He says it, we're going to read it in Matthew 25 here shortly. Come, you are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then he let them into heaven, enter into the joy of the Lord. And the others, to whom he did not say that, he cast them into hell. All right, so that phrase, inherit the kingdom of God, doesn't mean you just, you know, talking about just a few little blessings here on this earth. It's talking about your ultimate eternal destiny. But Paul said some of you guys were involved in those types of very grievous sins. Verse number 11 of 1 Corinthians 6, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit of our God. So yeah, you can be a former drunkard, a former thief, a for former homosexual, a former adulterer, if you've repented and you're walking in holiness, not doing those things any longer, Hallelujah. See, you meet the biblical standard. Now, aren't you glad that Paul didn't say sleepers in church during the sermons? <laughs> you know, aren't you glad he didn't say that? <laughs> you know, because, woo, that would, uh, a lot of us would be heading to hell. But that's, that's not within the, those, you know, bare minimum changes that occur in the lives of people who have truly repented. And there's other more minor things. that I'm not giving any excuse for them. I'm not saying we shouldn't follow the path of holiness and sanctification to always improve and so forth, but here's the bare minimum. Uh, here's another scripture, looking for these scriptural standards, biblical standards. Matthew 19, we just covered this one just a short time ago. Remember, we wrestled through this, the story of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and he asked him, what thing, what good thing shall I do to uh, obtain eternal life? 
And Jesus said to him, and now I'm reading to you again from Matthew 19 and uh, verse number 17, if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Ah, so Jesus believed that keeping the commandments has something to do with entering into life. And then he said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. Oh, that sounds familiar. Paul said, amen. You shall not steal. Oh, that sounds familiar. Paul said, these will not inherit the kingdom of God. You shall not bear false witness. That's lying. All liars and all murders, John warned, have their place in the lake of fire. And then Jesus went on to say, honor your father and mother. Wow, that's one that's Important. Well, of course it's important. It's one of the original Ten Commandments, the ten big ones that God gave to Israel and which often are repeated like uh, here in the New Testament and not just in the Gospels, but even in the epistles. We're told we should honor our mother and father. Paul said it. It's the first commandment with promise that you will uh, live long on the earth. Okay? And so are you honoring your parents according to the Bible? As the Bible, you know, prescribes? If not, you better repent. That's big. That's important. And then finally, he said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so uh, eternal life is tied in in some way with my relationships with others. Hmm. You got to be a lover. Well, does that surprise you? I mean, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second greatest commandment. Of course, that has something to do with eternal life. Of course it does. And we are, next time, going to read God's explanation, as it were, of at least a major component of what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. Oh my goodness. You know, it's, it's so clear in what we're going to read at the end of Matthew 25, how important it is to love your neighbor as yourself and how if you don't, you can miss out on eternal life. Okay, so you don't want to miss that. Can't wait. See you next time. Heavenward 7 is made possible by the financial support of viewers like you. Thank you.